Hello and welcome to the Green Market Podcast. Merely months ago, Netflix, social media and the social activist community were greeted with a juicy new topic to feed on. The Seaspiracy. A documentary that alleged what ultimately amounts to an Illuminati-esque fishing industry. Destroying the environment, leaving oceans teeming with blood and even slavery. Days after its release, the documentary tore watchers into two camps. Those who were convinced by one student's documentary to change their diet and their way of life and those who asked serious questions about the documentary's accuracy, agenda, and legitimacy. Since then, many of the guests and participants have alleged that they were misled and taken out of context. Yet the reality remains that some serious questions were raised. Questions of sustainability, ethics, and finance. Today we're going to try and deal with just some of them. Obviously, we've got a limited amount of time, and I'm delighted to be joined by Connor, who's the policy director at BCA, Alex, one of the policy researchers, And Francesca, the founder of Love the Oceans, a marine conservation organisation. How are we all? Yeah, great, thanks. Thanks for having me on. So Alex and uh, Connor are joining us from the UK. Um, Francesca is a little bit further abroad, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in Mozambique, so uh, different hemisphere. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we were just saying before we started recording, uh, the, the heat is, I think, plaguing all of us at the moment. Um, We're probably less expecting of it. Um, but we'll jump into uh, the documentary um, first off, because I think that's that's what the title of the of the podcast is going to be, and that, that that's really what sparked this. So obviously, this is something that I think for for all environmentalists, conservationists, this is uh, the, the seas are a very important part of the planet. Obviously, um, and the, the, there's a huge variety of takes on the documentary specifically. Um, so if we could just get a little piece from all of you, really. Um, what were your kind of initial impressions after listening to it um, or watching it and, and, and your broader feelings around it? Who's, who's going first? Are we, are we just designated to draw in straws? Yeah, I, I think I Connor, Connor, Connor's normally itching to go. So I think <laughs> I'm the most right vocal. In. There we go. <laughs> well, for me, I, I found it less of the documentary interesting, more the framing of the discourse around the documentary afterwards, particularly with the even some of the more left-leaning, very vocal on uh, climate issues coverage from places like Vox and The Guardian and that were very critical of the framing of the issues because it did contain quite a lot of factual errors as, as was already stated. I mean, for example, the claim that the entire world would be out of fisheries uh, reserves by 2048, the guy who made the original paper came out and said, actually, I did an updated paper a couple of years later and that's not true at all and you've misread that one. Uh, I know there was some speculation about how much fishing played into the Somali and Liberian civil wars as to whether that was a bit overstated. It seems that was more of a national sovereignty issue about illegal fishing than it was the fishing industry itself being at fault. Uh, the garbage patch claim about 46%, I mean, it's only about 10% of all plastic pollution is, is fishing that still can get that down but you know it wasn't the disaster number that was made up but the interesting one was the people who came out defending the documentary quite fervently despite those factual areas like George Monbiot who was featured quite conveniently they essentially said despite the factual errors the point made by the documentary is morally correct and it, it reminded me of the sort of AOC thing where it said too many people are obsessed with being factually and semantically correct and morally right I would like to say that you're probably not going to be morally right unless you are factually correct because disbelieving in brick walls won't stop you from running into one. However, in this case, I will say there is, I will be very charitable and say, I understand why saying things like reducing, not eliminating your fish, consu- fish consumption is a sensible individual devolution of responsibility uh, to each person to have an impact on the environment. So I, I'm, I was very intrigued by the discourse surrounding the uh, uh, documentary because it really showed how balkanized into camps both sides of the environmental debate are. Yeah, and just to follow on from that, um, my main takeaway from it was that they didn't actually offer many solutions as to how we can uh, solve the problem. I understand that there is a quite a large issue with um, overfishing. But just telling a lot of people, well, telling the global population to stop eating fish um, is quite ridiculous. Not only would it lead to food shortages, um, you're telling large communities that live on remote islands and even islands such as Japan, which rely massively on fish intake, that they're just going to cut out a huge part of their diet instantly. 
And fish, not only is it part of their diet, it's part of a lot of cultures as well. So you've got dishes like sushi, um, fish and chips in the United Kingdom. Changing that overnight is not something that's just possible. Francesca, yeah, I mean... Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to come yeah. to you, because obviously this is your area of, of real expertise. Be, it, it is really interesting to hear from someone who's really kind of operating in that industry. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting one, because the big documentary like this always splits crowds. Um, but the industry itself is tiny, um, so everyone knows everyone. So it's quite interesting uh, talking to people that have worked on it or, you know, had something to do with it or what was featured in it or whatever. And getting their, like, kind of uh, input on it, because I watched it myself, but having heard already a lot about it, and I tried to kind of take that out of my brain um and try and watch it for what it was and i ended up actually hosting two events around it um so i had to watch it twice and take proper notes and all the rest of it and really pay attention to it um i think obviously the factual incorrect facts it's like a massive issue because if you're going to do a documentary and yeah you can say oh well they're just a few acts a uh, few facts but you know the bigger picture that's true but then where do you draw that line on those on those facts and getting them wrong and that's a quite a slippery slope that you're going to fall down there um so that's one of the issues the flip side of that is that it was number one on netflix i don't think there's ever been an ocean documentary or anyone talking about the oceans as much as when sea spiracy was on number one on netflix and that's just that's great that, that there was so much talk about the ocean um, no matter what they were actually talking about, it was just great that the ocean even got any attention because usually it's so um, out of sight, out of mind for your general population. Um, I think there was obviously some quite large problems with it in terms of like the fact that it didn't, you know, def define the different types of fishing that you have um, and the fact that it questioned what sustainable fishing is when you actually can Google the definition. Um, and uh, and a lot of the fishery scientists themselves, I mean, we've been working in this industry that the entire point of a fishery scientist is to literally tell you how much the maximum yield of a fishery uh, is. Uh, and so then saying that the fishery scientists are actually the bad ones is literally the opposite of what they're doing. Like they are literally working to make sure that we don't overexploit our fisheries. So that was very confusing for me. And the villainization of NGOs in general was uh, very confusing because that just seemed like anger was pointed in the wrong direction when really, um, yes, individual action is important, but governments and laws, international laws and national laws are the most important when it comes to fisheries and government subsidies. So if the needed to be a call to action I wouldn't have gone for the call to action if it was me that was making this documentary I wouldn't have gone for a call to action that was around um, asking your individual people to stop eating fish um, I would have gone to the call of action of petitioning governments and trying to change those laws because the reach that documentary had there was a real potential to make real change and direct people's kind of frustration at the situation to a more worthwhile cause that said, obviously, if you're in a developing country, I think we all know by this point with climate change and the way that the oceans are cutting meat and cutting fish out of our diet where we can, that is a positive thing to do. Um, but in developing nations like where I work, uh, fisheries is very much a large part of the diet, like Alex said, and you can't tell people not to eat fish. They would starve, especially in our area. Um, so and the flip side of it is that also we like launched our sustainable fishing project last year, which is um, largely it's, it's all it's locally led and it's about um, eliminating net use in the area and moving towards kayak pole and line fishing. Uh, but we and we've been trying to secure funding constantly since the launch of the project because it's a six stage project and we need funding for each stage. But we actually had to put that on the back burner on our social medias when Sea Spiracy came out because we were getting hate and people were saying, you know, there's no such thing as sustainable fisheries. I know a lot of fishery scientists that got a lot of hate from it as well um, because they were painted as, as the kind of baddies in it. Uh, I think there was also a problem around representation. If you look at the number of scientists versus the number of activists, there were more activists in it. Um, and activists, like it or not, like activists do have an agenda. Um, so obviously they're going to be talking about their cause, which is totally fair enough, but you do need the scientists are the most important in my eyes. Obviously I'm a scientist, so I'm massively biased on this, but, 
um, the scientists are the most important people to be having on a documentary talking about environmental issues. Um, and then not only was there more activists than scientists, there was also not the not a great representation of women and certainly not of BIPOC people. Um, so there was an entire representation issue around it and a very um, developed world lens um, when it came to the entire documentary. Um, it was a young boy that had grown up in the UK kind of thing and it wasn't it didn't kind of encompass uh, small scale fisheries, artisanal fisheries, developing nations. It touched on it vaguely, but um, it was very much more focused on um, the individual in the Western world that's able to cut fish out of their diet. And perhaps they should have been a bit more specific that that was the target market when they made the documentary and made it clear that they, you know, weren't aiming it at a developing nation. It is quite interesting. But, as I said, I think. Sorry, go on. No, go, go, go. The, the, you mentioned uh, the, the role of scientists because uh, the, the chap that made the documentary, that was his answer when he was questioned over the uh, factual inaccuracies, was he, uh, I'm paraphrasing, he essentially said, I'm not a scientist, it's not going to be accurate, which I, I think when you're making a documentary that's intended to, to kind of um, create some change, it is probably not the best attitude to kind of operate with. Um, but I, something I'd like to take from what you were uh, just saying there is quite interesting. Would you say in kind of the wake of, of Seaspiracy that it has helped your cause or has it kind of hindered it in the short term? It's definitely hindered the sustainable fishing project that we've been um, trying to get funding for, like, definitely. And I think there's, I think we saw a similar thing when um, there was a guy a few years ago, I mean, it was a while ago now, but he wrote an article called The Obituary of the Great Barrier Reef. I don't know if you guys saw it, but basically it was this article that said the Great Barrier Reef had died and that it was gone. Um, and so loads of scientists got their funding pulled, tourism dropped in Australia, like it was nuts, like there was so much money lost. And the guy was just inaccurate because there's a difference between a dead coral reef and a bleached coral reef. And the algae can actually return to the bleached reef and it can actually get fully back to full health if the stress factor is removed. Um, and in some areas it has recovered. Um, but lots of people, like lots of projects, lost a lot of money, funding, donations because of this irresponsible reporting. So I think people can sometimes underestimate the power of media. Um, but yeah, I guess the balance of that is what I said with the with an ocean documentary being number one on Netflix. Like that is really, really great. Um, but it is, yeah, uh, I think responsible reporting is just so important in media. And to be honest, I was quite surprised that Netflix didn't take um kind of more responsibility with that but um i think it was independently filmed to begin with so um yeah i mean yeah <laughs> that's kind of my input on it out of interest guys um I, I probably should have started with this but just broadly do, do we all do you all eat fish is, is, is that something that has watching it changed it in, in any way and uh, has it had any impact whatsoever it wasn't possibly changed for me because I didn't really eat fish anyway. Because I, I sort of knew about the own fishing problem generally, and I, I, okay, if I can avoid it a little bit, sure. I mean, I eat my fair share of beef, so I might as well offset it one way. The only thing it did do, actually, I'll give it kudos for this. There was a discussion about uh, uh, alternative supplements towards the end of where they they were talking about okay, rather than fish oils, which aren't uh, always properly sourced, you have things like what was it? They were sourcing omega three from. Algae like from algae, algae oil, yeah. yeah which i which i was like okay you know what fair enough i'll look into that next time so congratulations you guys actually you, you did something there um yeah i don't actually eat that much fish i'm not a huge fan of it i, I mean i'll have it maybe once every fortnight so it's not a huge part of my diet anyway um so i don't really think i am particularly the problem so i probably wouldn't cut it out of my life completely but equally, I don't think I'd start eating a lot more fish either. I, th I think that does really go to one of the issues that uh, Francesca mentioned a minute ago um, in regards to the kind of people that this was targeting um, and the kind of people that it, it put the targets on. Um, and it seemed quite often to really be going, look how bad the developing world is and ignoring some cultural norms. So I think that one of the ones that having me, I lived in China for a long time and then they started talking about shark fin soup just as this huge evil which in the west it does seem well barbaric it's visceral you've got some really good imagery there but it, it's a really fundamental part of their medicine so it's hard for us to kind of i think really just start condemning something like that from a position where that's not not part of a society i think personally 
uh connor you're wincing a lot there. yeah because you can well you know because you can condemn it out of out of okay is it necessary or effective no cultural practices cultural relativism annoys the hell out of me because of course culture is going to differ but you can you can that's almost like saying that countries and cultures m stop people from morally progressing um for for me i would say uh, my my pushback is not so much because I, I don't disagree with Francesca at all. I think they should have been leveled at uh, uh, not not NGOs which are attempting to do the right thing, especially with the misrepresentation that I know of Dolphin Safe Label thing. They essentially said, oh, well, hang on a minute. Of course, we said that there could be no guarantees. That was that was misedited because we've actually seen about a 95% reduction in dolphin death since we brought this in. So you can't say it's going to be 100% all the time. There's no guarantees in life, but we have actually done a fair amount of steps and, and human beings are imperfect. I think part of what the, the the good thing about targeting the consumer somewhat is that things like um i know michael schellenberg has wrote, written a fair about bit about this but the whaling industry for example so there's a massive distinction between whale deaths that were that dropped since ironically fossil fuels in, in certain regions were brought in so that whale oil wasn't used as much and uh the uptake in vegetable oils for cooking in certain regions as well so that was a market force and also the fact that the un's policy on banning whaling that was brought in after Greenpeace did a lot of their activism in Canada. That was quite late on the game because it had already started dropping anyway. But at the same time, the US saw massively responsible for all the whale deaths. Um, so I found that quite ironic. For example, they were featuring George Monbiot, who is an open, uh, uh, I won't say eco-socialist, I don't wish to miscategorize his position, but he's very leftist. Um, so the fact that there was no mention on that, for example, and there's no tension between sometimes government legislation isn't the most effective method for getting it because sometimes it just doesn't play catch up and sometimes it's not the uh, evil enterprising capitalist countries or the evil developing countries who necessarily need to fish to build their economies that are, that are the problem it's the ones that have essentially a, a tragedy of the commons approach to fisheries does yeah not, i mean i think does this not pose right. a challenge then of, of how do we manage it in in finding that balance between the developed countries and, and lesser developed countries. I, I would imagine, Francesca, that's something you've got a bit more kind of on the grounds of expertise in. Uh, but that, that's a serious challenge for government legislating, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a difficult one because I think the whole documentary did want, I mean, it's in the title, it's called Seaspiracy. They wanted to have a conspiracy theory to work off. Um, so you had like that, I can't, like the moment of like where everything, they linked everything together and it was extremely tenuous links. And what they didn't explain is like, you know, they attacked Plastic Coalition for fighting against plastics, which Jackie Nuna has worked for like 25 years in the plastic space and pushed through some really important legislation on single use plastics and stuff like that. What they don't, what they didn't say is that it's a coalition, Mission Blue, which is featured in it and Sea Shepherd, also featured in it, are actually part of Plastic Coalition. So if you're going to rip apart that NGO, you're also ripping apart the same people that you're saying are essentially the goodies. I just didn't like how it split the the kind of, it split everything into goodies and baddies um, instead of this being a problem that we all need to work upon together and pressure governments to put new legislation in place, better MPA management. I mean, I don't know if you guys have heard of like the 3030 campaign um, the global 3030 campaign to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. That alone has a heap of work that needs to be going into it because there's talks of establishing these um, MPA, marine protected areas, in the middle of the high seas, which is lovely. And yeah, we probably do need some high seas MPAs, but re in reality, how do you police that? Because there's no international army. Like we don't have an international army that can that can police that. No country. It's so far from far from land that it's very hard to police anything like that 24 7 and make sure that people aren't exploiting it so i think like there's so many things that the documentary could have done and it was just such a shame that they kind of missed the point on that and instead wanted to point fingers at people that you know i think it's a bit silly to say um like they did it with rico barry as well to say like this cause is more important than this cause there are so many environmental issues that we face in this world and they're all critical right now because we've screwed the planet for so long that they're all coming to their head right now. So to then just pick one and go, that's the most important. And arguably, by quite a long shot, climate change is the most important. I don't even work in that space, but climate change is the most important because that's the entire climate. And without fixing climate change, there won't be humans around to be dealing with the rest of the issues. Um, so I think it's silly to say like this, cause is more important than this cause because one human like saying to Jackie Nuna 
why why do you care about plastics and not fishing like one human can't take on every environmental cause as a human you have to pick what you're going to focus on in your life that's the area you want to make a difference in and that's that's what you do um so that was plastics for that organization and and that's absolutely great we need more NGOs, more passionate people working in each of these spaces, not less people working in plastics. We just need more people working in every area. There needs to be more environmentalists, not people moving from sector to sector within environmentalism. We need the general public caring about all of these environmental issues. Um, so, yeah, I think like there are definitely some ups and downs around it, but I think it, the kind of message was lost in terms of where to direct that kind of anger and, and change. I think that's really summed up. I, I, one of the interviewees about two thirds of the way through, um, one of the bits that really stood out to me is, and this is a quote from him, he said, if you want to address climate change, the first thing you need to do is address the oceans. How? Just leave them alone. Um, and <laughs> that didn't feel overly sensible as, as a message. And it may be that it was just kind of taken out of context and it was more sensible in, in the scheme of the full conversation, which the documentary has done a couple of times. That may be the case. Um, but just as as a statement alone, it, it doesn't feel very smart. Um, and, and there seemed to be this kind of trend throughout the whole documentary where they, they really liked these very visceral images or um, really powerful numbers. Um, and I, I remember, Connor, when we were first, first speaking about this, one of the ones that really stood out was um, their numbers on combating uh, global hunger and then fishing yes. subsidies, and they just yeah. seem to completely gloss over the fact that people eat fish. We don't just get them out. That was that was well, that was going to be one of my points actually, because I remember that the fact that they said it was the UN the UN's number for combating global hunger was the same amount as spent uh, actually the more was spent on fishing subsidies every year. And if you just took one one thing from the other, and this is from Francesca's point of essentially saying one thing good, one thing bad, and none of the nuances between, they said if you take one number, the fishing subsidies, and just gave it to the UN, you'd solve world hunger. Well, wasn't that number factor in all of the people that presently eat fish as a primary food source? So if you depleted all that, you put massive amounts of stress on land agriculture, which already has its own issues. We don't have vertical farming at the moment uh, to sufficient capacities, so we're going to have a hard, hard time making uh, making up all the crop yields that we need. And then also, I, I also I want to pick up on the sort of individual level thing. I I... I would like to devolve more power to the individual. Let's put it that way, because um, I, I like the old what was it? T.S. Eliot quote of the cocktail party, where it's uh, where I hope there's something wrong with me, because if it's the world that's gone mad, I can't fix that. But the issue that they were promoting again, balkanizing things into objectively correct, and and this is this is the way to do things, and there's no nuance for the other position. Um, I know the documentary's producer has a a vegan meal to order service and to say that cutting fish out of your diet entirely was a moral good um the problem is if you're going to wean people onto purely plant-based diets from around the world i'm certain for example the the producer and the uh, documentary maker eat avocados for example a lot of people don't know that they take a lot more water uh, per fruit to produce than a lot of other crops and also presently it's about 80 percent of the, uh, the modern avocado trade is produced in one county in mexico that has 800 homicides a year because it's controlled by the cartels so a lot of social factors aren't taken into account for the alternative diets for example a lot of those diets aren't even feasible for the people that are heavily rely on the fish um so yeah it, it's the misrepresentation of facts and just sort of the, the overlooking of what the the social implications of their solutions is is pretty astounding and it's pretty symptomatic again, as, as Francesca said, of, of balkanizing things into into a black and white morality that's a, a sort of false construct in this situation. Yeah, and just to add on to what was, what Connor was saying um, in terms of like the diet, I think it misses the point in terms of because um, I work with a lot of different fishery scientists and just know a lot in kind of my circle. And what everyone's kind of been shouting about on the back of Seaspiracy is it's not about necessarily reducing your fish consumption it's about diversifying your fish consumption there are like five major species that we eat in the uk like salmon tuna cod haddock and then you have crustaceans as well so shrimp lobster and things like that and that's all we eat when people go to the shop and they want to eat something they'll order a prawn they'll, they'll get a prawn cocktail salad they'll get um salmon for that night they'll get cod with their chips like we only ever eat those fish so yes those fish populations are under pressure and are overfished in a lot of different areas and a lot of different subpopulations but if we actually diversified if you think about how many different species we have in the sea how how many different 
pelagic and carnivorous fish that we could eat instead of tuna, but we don't, there's a, if we all diversified our food consumption, there would be less pressure on cert, on these five food groups, and there'd be a spreaded it would be spread out and less pressure on on the uh, yeah on these five food groups, and we wouldn't have the collapsing fishery situation that we have at the moment. Um, so I think also an important point is not necessarily well. Obviously, it's great to reduce your your fish consumption, but diversifying your fish consumption is is really really important. Yeah, I think that, I think that's a very interesting point, and it, it, there seemed to be a theme running through the whole documentary that um, the makers seem to think that uh, consumption and cons- and conservation were two completely different things, and they could never be compatible. Um, which I think it, you only have to look at look at Scotland and the preservation of wildlife in Scotland. It's it's the conservation industry is is reliant on the shooting industry, for example. They they, they can't exist without the other. Um, the money's just not there, and uh, Scotland's wildlife is pretty consistently fl- thriving, and that, there's no reason why um, a, a similar symbiosis can't take place in the sea. And I, I think he just, or the documentary as a whole, seemed to either intentionally just not address it, or just didn't seem to understand that you could have two things at once. It was this, it was this mute, like exclusivity again that I think uh, popped up. Which again, I don't know what, whether that was intentional. It's, it's quite interesting that. Uh, one of the producers had had the the vegan food business because the last what, 10 15 minutes of the documentary did feel just like an advert um, <laughs> i was sitting there and it was just it was just videos of food and i was like it did feel odd um and then that did make me question kind of the intent of the first hour then if that was what the the end of it was like yeah what? also you got like the, one of the i think it was either a co-producer or yeah i think it was a co-producer that is the guy that created cowspiracy um yeah. and that's so like there was a gender right there from the start and Ali, the, the director, he has been a vegan for like six years, a vegan campaigner. So when he was saying, you know, I haven't thought about this before, he has, it's vegan. So um, it's not something that hasn't come on his radar. So I think um, like veganism is great and I try to eat more vegan in my diet and stuff like that and, uh, and avoid the kind of food groups that Conan was talking about because there's so many different social issues to consider as well. Um, especially in developed world like veganism but in an area like ours you that's just not possible you can't you can't eat like vegan and you can't cut fish from your diet like fish is such an essential part of people's diets the main primary source of protein um and it's also a primary source of livelihood as well um so cutting fish in in especially like uh, the last year and a half of covid has seen the collapse of the tourism industry in mozambique Mozambique shut its borders from March to October last year. Um, and that was eight months, tourism dropped by 95%. Like we have in our area, 70% of people are unemployed. So there's only 30% of people employed. And of those 30% have dependents. So they all like support family, friends, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and with the collapse of the tourism industry, that 30% then became unemployed as well and didn't have a source of income as well and so people turned to the ocean as a food source and as a source of income and that's why we launched our sustainable fishing project to make sure it was being done sustainably and eliminate net use but you just veganism is not an option for like three billion people on the planet that rely on fish as a primary uh, protein source um so i think it's very much a, a luxury um that said i also think probably the people that can access netflix um, and we'll be watching that, that documentary potentially won't be from this corner of the, well, my specific community. I only know a handful of people that have Netflix, so I don't know um, whether people would be watching that documentary around here. But I think if if they were, I, I think it just wouldn't it wouldn't strike a chord because it's just very far fetched for, um, for areas like ours. But um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just very applicable to the Western world and it wasn't very globally encompassing, but that's just me. I did well, think it was particularly obviously. interesting that uh, throughout, they quite consistently, when they when they were looking for the very visceral images, which I can see as a documentary that's trying to encapsulate your attention, obviously it's going to have very visceral images, but they were often, I mean, the vast majority that they used were dolphins and whales. So they've obviously picked animals, which I think, are, I don't, that's seen as cute maybe the wrong word, but, but, 
seen as more human i i, I don't really know how to we, we have more of an affinity to them for some reason do you think that's a legitimate reason if you could create some sustainable fishing around somewhere like around wales for example so i, I think you can still eat whale in iceland despite uh, various bits of legislation if they could prove that they were doing it sustainably does that make a difference the fact that they're mammals because it, it seems to for a lot of people but but rationally why so I think there is a massive difference here and I think people kind of get confused between animal rights activists and conservationists. So conservationists are generally there and you also have two types of conservation. You have conservation of a species and conservation of an individual. And there's been big arguments within the NGO space between different NGOs for conserving different things. Like there's an argument to be had about pandas and the fact that we've spent so much money and so much time preserving pandas, which uh, form no functional um, kind of they have no function in what in the wild um, they have no kind of ecological niche that is really important to keeping any kind of ecosystems um, and then you have sharks that are exploited at a huge rate that are a keystone species and the removal of them creates a cascade effect through the marine ecosystem so I think um, there's yeah you've got this like this different different types of conservation and different types of uh, like feelings, I guess people utilize when they're when they're talking about dolphins and mammals and and these kind of like what we I guess friendly animals, the, the ones that we kind of make into cuddly toys. Um, they're very much playing on the individual's feelings, but like dogs, the individual's feeling to protect that in like that individual uh animal and that kind of these animals that we have projected human feelings onto because also feelings are a human construct like animals don't feel the way humans do um because we've literally created that for our brains to understand it um so i think uh it's 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 difficult because as a conservationist i don't like if there was a sustainable people would say to me because i've been obsessed with sharks since i was a kid like would you eat shark if it was sustainable I'm like, yeah, yeah, I probably would. Like, I don't have a emotional attachment to it. What I'm worried about is the is the conservation of the species as a whole. And that's very different to an individual. So I would eat fish if I know where it is from. I know the species and how it's been caught and all of that kind of jazz. Um, but I wouldn't eat it out of a supermarket that's likely been fished using trawler and, you know, in an unsustainable fisheries. So I think... Um, yeah, it's a difficult one, but I think we're definitely playing on people's emotions when you use um, animals and especially like the last scene in the entire documentary, which I actually thought was almost completely irrelevant um, of the slaughter um, of uh, it was the it was the which where was that again? It was Faroe Islands. In, yeah, Faroe Islands. Yeah, they go Faroe Islands slaughter. And um, that I just thought was pretty irrelevant and the entire point of it was just to create that emotive response in the audience it wasn't anything to do with commercial fisheries um, or you know sustainable fisheries or anything like that they just wanted some bloodshed and some emotive images um, so yeah I think there's a difference between being concerned of the species as a whole versus being concerned of you know those individual welfare individuals welfare which is very much what they were featuring when they were featuring them. Faroe Islands um, and yeah just they just wanted people to be emotive about that. It's funny yeah. you say that because I actually thought they started off the first 15-20 minutes of the documentary and none of it was really about overfishing it was just about dolphins and whales for the first 15 to 20 minutes and then right at the end it went back to a similar narrative and I think that was all just to sort of like draw you in to what they were trying to tell you for the next hour or so and that was just the structure they were trying to use and try and create yeah. a more emotive uh, reaction to it i, I yeah, think I it was as as francesca said in terms of uh, the the documentary maker and the producer in that were already vegan and then they misrepresented it as oh we sort of stumbled across this the evidence led us to believe this i think it's that plus the misrepresented facts plus the emotive framing of it um it, it's essentially trying to promote a a pre-agreed upon moral conclusion that you should abandon fish as a practical argument. And the thing is the practical argument falls down on both its, its inability to consider 
outside the West, the realities of, of the fishing industry and, and people's dependency on it for nutrition and livelihoods. And also when you factually misrepresent things, you're undermining the legitimacy of your practical argument. All you're doing is essentially uh, espousing religious dogma with a, with a, a ideologically slighted perception of the facts and, and it just discredits you. And unfortunately, it's, as you said, Francesco, it discredits a lot of the sustainable fishing industry um, uh, by consequences. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's just a, a shame because there was like an army created of, of eco-warriors that was great, um, that was inspired from back of the conspiracy. It was just directed in very much the wrong direction. Um, and I know like Plastic Coalition had to shut off all the comments on their social media. They lost a lot of funding. It, they didn't even know they were in the documentary until the trailer aired. Um, it's, it's pretty crazy to kind of watch the fallout from it and what like irresponsible journalism can do. Um, but yeah. I think that's one of the main issues about it is as well as the fact that it's so negative in what it's trying to tell you. It's not trying to promote any ways of how you can actually be better for the fishing industry and the marine wildlife around the world. It's just bashing everyone, especially in the West, just saying, don't eat fish, don't do this, don't do that. There's no positive solutions that they're trying to... Um, promote within the within the actual documentary yeah and i think that um just going back to the individualism as well i think we see this with climate change as well um governments and like big corporate organizations saying you know turn your light off save the planet and really that's not what's going to save the planet like there's 12 massive organizations corporations that are responsible for the majority of our um emissions um and it's them that really needs to make the changes and it's the same with fishing it's the it's the governments that need to make the changes with fisheries and what what's allowed what's not allowed and and better regulations better technology all of that kind of stuff and yeah your individual choice does make a small impact and on a large scale that can make a big impact but if you're only applying that to you know a third of the world that's very rich anyways is that really what we should be doing or should we be you know, lobbying the government to change legislation to end subsidies, fishery subsidies, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I think that would be a much more effective way of handling this issue um, and creating, you know, creating sound MPA marine protected areas um, that go by the 3030 rule. The 3030 rule is great, but we need management in place that can handle that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a shame that it just missed that. They did seem to be using, um, in regards to the mammals, this psychological trick from the beginning where they kind of started with sea worlds, which has uh, long been something which I think has, has incurred moral outrage from large swathes of people. And I think broadly, I'm not sure of the exact statistics, I think you'd find the majority of people now are slightly uncomfortable with it. Um, and they started with something then, obviously, which was very digestible lots of people could get on board with and then kind of coupled that in with this larger conspiracy which not really connected but you agreed with them on the first thing so you're probably going to be more appeasable moving forward and it's, it's the oldest psychological trick in the book but it was very obvious they were doing it from the beginning and if you need to be doing something like that from the beginning it probably suggests that the rest of your your argument or your pitch for the necessary change and the evils of this industry are probably not the most most accurate, most impactful, um, or the most helpful. But no, on something like SeaWorld, um, as much as it has it incurred huge swathes of, of people coming out against it, what are your opinions on it? Um, I, is there any in the UK? I'd be, I'd be very surprised if there were. I'm, I'm not something I've heard much about. Um, but what are your guys kind of stand on that? Obviously, cap dissertations is not a great thing. Um, sorry, just jumping in there. And we're partners with the World Cetacean Alliance and they actively campaign to end um, cetacean captivity. There is an argument, um, I, did a, I did an event recently with some dolphin trainers, which was really, really interesting to kind of get the other side of the argument because I haven't spent that much time with any dolphin trainers or cetacean trainers. Um, so kind of understanding it from their side was really interesting. But um, there is an argument, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen the hashtag empty the tanks campaign um to end captivity and that's really great and don't get me wrong i am 100 percent in support of no cetaceans being in captivity anymore but you have an issue of cetaceans that have been bred in captivity that would otherwise not survive in the wild um, and so they do actually have to stay in captivity so you can't really empty all the tanks um, but 
yeah I mean obviously uh, I'm sure have you guys seen The Cove uh, and anyone who listens to this if you haven't seen The Cove then go go away and watch it it's, um, it's a really great documentary and that's why I was quite shocked in the conspiracy at the beginning they just covered the, the exact same stuff that happens in The Cove um, which was kind of ironic because they're doing an environmental documentary yet they flew to the other side of the world to film something that's already been very much covered um, and interview the guy that covered it um, uh, but um yeah, so basically the cove demonstrates the horrific impact that um, the dolphin trade has. And it's obviously very emotional. It does tap into emotions again in terms of cetaceans, um, cetaceans, well, dolphins, well, dolphins, and foxes. Um, and it is very emotive. Uh, I made my mum watch it and she cried. Um, and, uh, but it also has an impact on our dolphin populations, uh, the social implications as well in terms of the mercury levels of the meat that was then being sold off the back of uh, the dolphins being caught. Um, so the dolphin trade is something that definitely needs to end. Obviously, same with orcas, um, that all of that kind of stuff needs to stop. And there, I think there does need to be a line. And for me personally, I think it's a very personal thing where you draw this line. Um, but there needs to be a line on what you keep in captivity and what where you draw that line of no, that animal shouldn't be here. Um, and I think there's definitely an argument for education. Like I went to London Aquarium when I was eight. I saw a shark. That was what inspired me initially to get into marine conservation. Um, and now I like work actively in um, shark conservation. But and and I and I do think that that was. <laughs> I don't want to say worth it because obviously that individual that's like a lifetime of um, captivity but sharks don't have the same brains that dolphins and whales have mammals have more developed brains um, and that's why for me I've drawn the line on mammals being in captivity and that is definitely something I don't support but I do think that there is a space to be held for zoos and aquariums and also I think that potentially people don't understand the entire implications of captivity as well like I was talking to a zoo owner in Fife in Scotland the other day and um, he was saying that they have seed banks so they basically um, collect um, uh, sperm and eggs and help diversify wild populations of animals using captive sperm um, which is really really interesting and, and it's stopping genetic bottleneck in the wild so it's actually helping wild populations as well um, so scientifically that is really really good news uh, so I think there's definitely an argument to and for uh, captivity I don't think it's black and white it's it's really not like uh, it's, it's I think a very personal thing and you've got to kind of examine where your morals fall and what you prioritize in your life and value uh, to be able to make that kind of call. I um I was I was going to pick up on a couple of things in there just because firstly I I won't deviate from what you said about uh, the roles of zoos and aquariums because I agree pretty much entirely with what you said there um, but the the thing I found quite interesting you said particularly about was the mercury content of the, of the dolphins and I found it really strange I understand that they wanted to stop people eating fish entirely but I found it strange that they didn't use a, a specific appeal to the reduction of us consuming microplastics in the documentary as an appeal of why we should care about the issue because um, part of that was wrapped up in the whole what, what's the what's what was the term for it the great pacific garbage patch um yeah I, that they said oh, about 46 percent of that is fishing lines okay but the actual garbage patch itself isn't massive it's a lot of surface level stuff but the main issue with it is a lot of it breaks down very quickly into microplastics and then goes through fish and it even goes into i saw one thing recently where people were trying to use seaweed and algae as uh, low methane diets for cows problem is if it's in all the plants and it's also going to get into your land agriculture and then it's going to get into us a different way they did a massive study of all of the tinned fish i think across like four continents and all of the brands had some form of microplastic in them uh, that you could see under a microscope which isn't the most encouraging thing in the world um so i was i was quite surprised that they didn't want to tackle the microplastics issue more directly and it was it was like you said the assault on the ngos which are tackling plastic as a sort of specification of a labor issue they said oh why aren't you tackling fish instead of plastic well because people develop a specific area of expertise and you you don't want you know too many cooks spoil the broth essentially um but I, I did find it very interesting that also essentially wasn't covered uh, as a whole in in the documentary but they went on and bashed for example the scottish fisheries saying oh you could get chlamydia from this etc and they also didn't cover the fact that the scottish fisheries with uh, salmon are uh, doing gmo projects which seem to be fairly safe and also could be a, a 
a possible alternative to depleting the major fish reserves. It, it was it was a massive oversight in, in many respects of that. So, yeah, I think the the mercury thing is it, it is a bit strange they didn't pick up on mercury because tuna, especially, that's why there's a recommended daily amount on the back of the tuna tin because the mercury levels high mercury levels in tuna, um, and any fish high up food web has that. So the large carnivorous species have that. Sharks included, dolphins, whales, all of that kind of stuff. They have a high mercury content. In terms of the microplastics, I don't know why they did it. From my point of view, why they didn't do it, rather. Um, from my point of view, I guess it might be because we're kind of screwed with plastics anyway, right? Like, they are everywhere. We breathe them in. Like, I, I was talking to a friend recently who does microplastic research in Plymouth, and she looks at microfibers in particular, and there's so much microfibers in the air that you're breathing in microfibers, plastic, all the time. Um, you're drinking from water bottles that are made of plastic <laughs> you're like eating food that has had plastic in this at some point or packaged at least in plastic like plastics in every area and I'd be quite frankly amazed if they if we didn't every single one of us um, have plastic in our bodies already in some way shape or form like they found plastic in human embryos they found plastic in the stomach of baby turtles like they found plastic everywhere um so perhaps they didn't do that one because it's a it's a kind of fairly well known rhetoric in terms of plastic. But I mean, I couldn't I couldn't speak for them at all. Um, I have no idea, and I would have thought like yeah, same as you, Connor, that it would have played to their advantage for them to cover that. But I don't know. Perhaps they were running out of time and they wanted to prioritize I don't know dolphins or something instead. We'll be getting a sequel of Plastic Spiracy next year, maybe. Um, we, can, we can delve into that well, a bit maybe again. maybe if they decide to blow the slaver in thailand this time they might actually fly to thailand because i yeah. found out that that bit wasn't even filmed there so as, as you picked up on francesca the fact that they were flying around it'd be great if they would actually if you're going to use the air miles at least go to the bloody location you're meant to be talking about <laughs> um on <laughs> on that note guys i think it's it's probably time to to wind up thank you very much all for your time um especially francesca and i we really did appreciate um, having you on. And I know, I know there's a little bit of time difference, so you're probably very, very busy. Um, <laughs> but thank you to Alex and Connor as well. Um, hope that's been interesting to everyone. Uh, I've certainly really enjoyed that. Um, thank you all very, very much. Thanks very much, Mike. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you.